Are you ready to alter your life? Because that's what's about to happen. If you're looking for a judgment-free zone where TMI doesn't exist, to have the conversations you're not supposed to have, and explore how to make small yet substantial, sustainable changes in your life to actually care for and empower yourself through physical and emotional fitness, then you're in the right place. I'm your host, Alyssa Alter, M-O-M-D-O-N, the Amy Poehler of vaginas, author, speaker, coach, former Broadway performer, certified Pilates instructor, pelvic health expert, comedian, co-founder of postpartum.com, mom on the mend, and board certified doctor of nothing. I believe that if we put as much time, energy, and discipline on our insides as we do our outsides, we'll be unstoppable. Despite what Billy Madison said, peeing in your pants isn't cool. And it certainly doesn't make you Miles Davis. Now, all right, buckle up, friend, because we today, it is happening. Unclench your butt because we are going there. Today's guest, Dr. Allison Polland, is absolutely brilliant. And I want to take a moment and share with you before I tell you a little bit about what to expect on today's episode. Allison and I met like any two pelvic health professionals meet at the playground where their children were playing together and just casually striking up a conversation about vaginas. I mean, does anybody else do this or is this just me? Please let me know. So we started chatting and it turns out she's a urogynecologist, which I don't know about you, but I did not know that a urogynecologist was a thing until after having my baby. And until after, like until I was already deep into my recovery from my fourth degree tear. And this is a specialty that we deserve to know about before or after and after and during and that this exists because so many things that we are taught and conditioned to tolerate as part of the female experience and the experience of having uh, female reproductive anatomy uh, are things that you can do something about like urinary incontinence. So we're going to be talking about what, what incontinence is is the different types, what pelvic organ prolapse is, which you may have heard of um, referred to as POP, and what they are, what your options are in terms of treatment and care that you can get, and how this does not have to be forever, right? There are treatments and there are modifications that you can make to your lifestyle and your diet, including you may not need to drink as much water as you think. There is a lot of messaging around that. And I think with any information that is given as broad, this is for everyone, there are certain instances where that's not perfect for everybody. And my purpose in today's episode, you know, my goal and in everything that I do is not to tell you what to do, but to give you information and and empower you and give you permission and space to ask your questions and figure out what is best for you. Dr. Allison Polland, she is a board certified doctor in both urology and urogynecology. She's also the director of Maimonides Pelvic Floor Center. She completed her undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering at Yale University. Have you heard of it? And then went on to med school at Columbia University. I know I had to Google it too. She then completed her general surgery internship and urology residency at Mount Sinai Hospital before going on to fellowship at Georgetown University. University. So clearly she has no idea what she's talking about. She is absolutely incredible. And I am so excited to share this conversation with you. You'll hear that I definitely enjoy nerding out real hard about all things pelvic floor. And something I love about Allison is that she's presenting this information in words and contexts that aren't purely clinical. Like we, you can understand what she's saying and even consider how this shows up in your life. And I think that is so important. And I'm also really excited for you to listen till the end of the episode when Allison shares 
her number one tip on how to care for, advocate for, and embody your body. And a hint, but not a spoiler alert, it's something I can help you with. Emergency room, actually, because she said, oh my gosh, I'm peeing out of my vagina. And the doctors did all the exams, all the workup, and they just could not find anything wrong. And so they said, wait a minute, we don't really know where the pee is coming out from. Why don't you just pee for us and we'll take a look and see, you know, what we can see. And the pee came out of her urethra and they were like, that's where it's supposed to come out of. And she said, really? I never knew. We, we have to talk about this because this is why I tell in anyone that I work with when it comes to pelvic floor health, I say, take a mirror and look at your vulva. Look at your vagina. Look at your pieces and parts. Because I too have worked with women who don't realize that the hole that your pee comes out of, that's the urethra, I call it the pee hole, is different than your V hole, which is your vagina, which is where like your period comes out of, a baby could come out of, and penetrative vaginal sex happens. And that these are separate holes. They're neighbors, but they are not the same. And this is what Allison, this is why you're here. This is why I'm excited to have you on the show because we are not taught about our bodies. The basic anatomy, I mean, I guess like, I mean, I remember freshman year of high school, like in health class, there was a diagram and I had to like label the parts and that was the test, you know, but like to really practically know what we're dealing with. Right. And it's also, you know, health class in high school is sort of nobody really pays attention other than, you know, maybe they want to learn how to put a condom on a banana. Um, but other yeah. than that, think, <laughs> you know, it's not considered like one of the important classes. And so I think everybody kind of says, eh, I'm not going to pay attention here. If there's one class I'm going to zone out on, it's this. And the problem is that then you end up with a whole bunch of adults who didn't pay attention in high school and don't know about their pelvic anatomy, don't know about their anatomy in general. I think that there's like a real need for um, education just about anatomy and physiology um, because I've also had patients who have bladder problems and they go, what's a bladder? And so, you know, if you don't know that you have a bladder that stores the urine, then it's kind of hard to imagine why the urine's not coming out because you didn't realize there was a bladder that stored it in the first place. So many people come to me and say, oh, well, I know it's normal that I just, you know, some pee comes out when I sneeze. And I say, no, it's not normal. It's common, but it's not normal. And there are things we can do to fix it. And the fact that the women think it's normal, they just don't go to the doctor. They don't think, well, this could be fixable. And listen, if it doesn't affect your quality of life, if it's like something really minor that only happens once in a while and it doesn't bother you, go ahead. Like you don't need to fix it. But if it's really affecting your quality of life, no, it's not normal. It's fixable. Well, and that's what I see is when people come to me, because you know, as you know, as everyone knows, I'm a doctor of nothing. When people come to me, it's more about being able to move confidently in their body. It's more that mind-body connection or how the mind stuff is showing up in the body, the body stuff is showing up in the mind, that if you can't, if you aren't sneezing confidently or feel comfortable going to like a wedding and dancing without wearing like a pad, it affects how you feel in your body. Like you're self-conscious. You don't, you're embarrassed. Can other people tell? Does it smell? Like you, you're not able to really show up and that then shows up in all areas of your life. And that's That's when we really want to address it and drive home the point that this is a common thing that can happen in our bodies for a variety of reasons, and there are solutions. This is a sign of something dysfunctional, meaning not that something's wrong with you, but something is not functioning properly. And that can be, sometimes that needs to be addressed surgically, sometimes physical therapy, sometimes a 
ser- s- series of Pilates sessions to address your alignment so that your organs are balancing on each other in the proper way and you know how to utilize your muscles to support your body in the best way. Also, again, sometimes you need a surgery and it's like, and bing, bang, boom, carry on. Now, something I want to touch on because we dove right in. You know, it wasn't until I tore my everythings that I even heard of a urogynecologist. So, and that also, I think, is part of the issue that we don't even know that this exists to then, you know, we go to our regular gynecologist or we go to our primary care and when we don't get the answer, we're like, well, I guess the, I guess the problem is me. So can you tell, can you share what you do? Sure. What is urogynecology? So uh, urogynecology (laughs) is where urology and gynecology meet. Um, Some people get there by becoming a gynecologist first and, you know, delivering babies and then do subspecialization in urogynecology. Um, Other people like me became urologists first and uh, dealt with urinary incontinence and kidney stones and then specialized in uh, urogynecology. And so this is the area where the two meet. So it's, you know, how does the location of your bladder, of your urethra, of your uterus affect your urinary function? Um, And it is a specialty where there unfortunately aren't as many providers um, in urogynecology as there are, for example, general gynecologists. And general gynecologists Mm -hmm. know about urogynecologists, but they may not be thinking to refer you because they may say, well, everything looks fine on exam, but you have to remember a gynecologist, when they do an exam, they just put a speculum in and say, looks like a good cervix to me. And um, (laughs) if you're not bringing it up and saying, listen, I feel like there's something falling down in my vagina, there's like a ball there, they're not going to look for it. And that's an exam that's done differently than a usual gynecologic exam. Because a usual gynecologic exam is basically you're up in, you know, stirrups and the speculum goes in. As a urogynecologist, I'm examining patients in different positions. I'm, you know, trying to see how do I see the bulge? And sometimes I'll tell people, you know, they say, I only feel it at the end of the day. I say, make an afternoon appointment. I want to see the bulge when it's worse because that really makes a difference. Um, Pelvic organ prolapse, like you said, is basically when the pelvic organs are descending in the vagina. So it could be your bladder coming down, your uterus coming down, your rectum coming down. And some people will just feel like a pressure or a heaviness. And some people will actually say, you know, when I wipe, I feel there's something sticking out there. And you might feel it more when you're, you know, towards the end of the day or when you've been really active on your feet. And maybe you don't feel it first thing in the morning when you've been lying down all night and everything is back in place. Um, The other thing people see a a urogynecologist for is for incontinence, which is urine leaking. And um, some people will say, oh, I'm not incontinence. I just have a drip here and there. Um, and again, this is all about bother. So if you're not that bothered, a drip here and there is no big deal. But if it's bothersome to you, you don't have to be wearing diapers to come see a urogynecologist. Now, let me ask you a question. Asking for a friend, JK, it's me. Fecal incontinence is also something that can happen whether or not you tore your butthole. And what I learned, and I'm very, I learned this on the internets, so you know, I, I want to verify this, that that also includes farts, gas. Yes. So because mm-hmm. God. the what the optimally functioning muscles, it's a pressure management system and they should, our sphincters, our anal sphincters do have the double, double duty work. I didn't even mean to make that joke, but can't stop, won't stop. Um, of also being able to distinguish between gas, solids, and liquid in terms of how much work they have to do with the pressure management so you don't fart unexpectedly or if you have diarrhea, you can hold it in or solid stool. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Tell me something about that. Sure. Um, <laughs> So as a urogynecologist, I treat both urinary and fecal incontinence. And you're right, fecal incontinence is not just I wear a diaper all the time because there's poop coming out. Fecal incontinence could be I lose gas sometimes. Um, It could be, you know, like I have accidents when I have diarrhea, but if it's solid, I can hold it. Or it could be like sometimes I look down and there's just a log in my underwear. Um, And all of those things are treatable. Um, You know, for fecal incontinence, There's a lot of behavioral stuff you can do. So if when you have diarrhea, you have accidents, then 
try to change your diet. Try to make sure that you're not having diarrhea. Um, you know, sometimes you could even take an anti-diarrhea medication um, on a regular basis so that you, you know, can have more solid stools. Um, another big thing is physical therapy. Um, you know, how do you get those muscles to coordinate, um, to uh, work better, to kind of maintain pressure all the time, and then to open when you need them to open? Because if they're not opening when you need them to open, then you can end up with this constipation thing where you basically don't poop for five days in a row. And then all of a sudden you have five days worth of bowel movements in one day because the sphincter just couldn't hold it anymore. And that's where you're getting into accidents. Um, And so it's really important that you learn how to use those muscles and use them correctly. I was just going to say, and use them correctly to just make that distinction again for educational purposes, because I'm sure that um, someone listening to this with, with that, like thinking about using those muscles properly, you, everyone like unclench your butt because you probably started clenching your butt cheeks, your glutes, which these muscles are super, super, super important to pelvic health, supporting your pelvis, your spine. Absolutely. Those muscles are different than your anal sphincter, than your puborectalis, than the bulbospongiosis and all these other muscles of the pelvic floor that are actually really the muscles that we want to focus on having the ability to really use functionally and fully engage and fully release because a healthy muscle can is like a dimmer switch. It can go all the way through the range of motion. It's just not one or the other. And if we just clench our butt cheek, we're not we're I say feeding the beast like we're not helping find that balance we're feeding the imbalances so everybody unclench your butt and then we can proceed yes (laughs) Um, I'll also mention some of the other treatments for fecal incontinence for people who you know your dietary modification and your exercise and physical therapy in terms of like learning how to squeeze and learning how to relax Um, for people that that doesn't work for um, you can actually do bulking which is Basically where, like, you know how people get filler in their lips? Um, You can put filler around um, the uh, anus and that kind of helps to close the hole a little bit. So um, for people who are having, you know, some incontinence, you can use that. Um, Another option is uh, a sacral neuromodulation device, which is basically a pacemaker um, for, and it actually works for the bladder and the rectum. And it is sending nerve, like signals to the nerves that go to the bladder and the rectum to get them to stop sending the wrong signals. And it helps with, you know, the fecal incontinence. It actually, in Europe, it helps with constipation. In the U.S., it's not approved for that. I didn't say anything about constipation and sacral neuromodulation, but it does help. <laughs> and it's also great for the urine. Well, that's let's bring it back to the front and talk about this with the with urinary incontinence because I mean, we'll. Again, I could I could be wrong, um, but certainly what I've heard from people coming to me and the research that I've done as not a doctor, because I'm not a doctor, you're a doctor, um, that the urinary incontinence is more prevalent. Yes. Um, and these other things that can happen to that can be solutions. But I also want to spend a moment because I talk to people about this too, about the nerve signals and the conversation between the bladder and the pelvic floor and our brain. And that, you know, if you've had recurrent UTIs, if you've been pregnant and that organ has literally gotten smushed, so the nerves have gotten smushed, like picture them like telephone wires, like communication is has been compromised, that there needs to be a retraining that, that we then set healthy habits to reestablish open communication, which as we know, helps with every relationship. How and I'm, I'm going to just lead with this question. Obviously, there's variation in this, but like how often should we pee and how much should we roughly expect to pee? So there basically I'm going to go through this and then I'm going to also discuss um, the reasons why people have incontinence. So how often should Great. you pee? You should pee about every three to four hours. Um, if you're not drinking much, you could pee every six hours. If you're drinking a ton, you may pee every hour. 
Um, you should not be going eight to 12 hours without peeing. That's too long. And that's pee sitting around in your bladder and that can get infected. In terms of mm. how much should mm-hmm. you pee, the average person can pee 300 to, will feel full at 300 to 500 milliliters. Um, so I, you know, it's kind of hard to I'm, say exactly. I'm how- literally pic- picturing like, like, isn't a bottle of wine like 750? Uh, yes. So I'm like, okay, have a <laughs> That's my frame of reference. (laughs) Okay, so everybody's with me. Okay, we know that as as a reference point. Okay. Um, So in terms of incontinence, there's kind of two kinds of incontinence. There's overactive bladder with urgency incontinence. And basically that's, I feel like I have to pee and I'm running to the bathroom and the pee just comes out. Um, and that's related to your bladder um, either being a little bit small in terms of the amount of urine that it can hold, or more commonly, detrusor overactivity, which is your bladder is squeezing when it shouldn't be squeezing. Um, mm. And you know, if your bladder is really because it's a muscle, it's a muscle. Yep, it's not a muscle that we have control over. So some of the muscles in our body we're supposed to have control over. Um, voluntary skeletal muscle. Exactly. This is involuntary smooth muscle. Exactly. So we have no control Mm -hmm. over our bladder muscle, but we can control things like the um, pelvic floor muscles. And that helps us, you know, the reason why physical therapy and Pilates may be helpful for urgency and continence is because if you can kind of squeeze the muscles that we do have control over, sometimes that sends a negative feedback signal to the bladder to say, hey, there's no bathroom here. So hold off on the squeezing situation until we get to a bathroom. Yeah, the bladder and the pelvic floor, the way I describe it, and you tell me if I'm doing this wrong, I, and this is a simplification because again, like I'm not a doctor and I'm not teaching people to be doctors. We're just working on understanding what's happening. It's kind of like a seesaw, you know? So if the, if the pelvic floor is engaged, the bladder's relaxed. So like if it's up, that's down. So then if the bladder is squeezing, the pelvic floor relaxes. I like that analogy. To let the pee out. So if we send the signal, like if we hold our pelvic floor, right, and that's up, it kind of, it helps sort of turn off the engagement of the bladder Mm -hmm. because they, they're not really going to happen at the same time. Um, And again, for everyone who's now doing a Kegel and closing their urethral sphincter, because we're talking about it, you can't talk about Kegels and not do them that we can, there will be a separate episode dissecting Kegels. Um, But if you are squeezing your butt cheeks when you are doing a Kegel, you're doing too much. You've gone too far. It's too much of a good thing. It should have, it's much smaller than that. Your butt cheeks can be relaxed while you're doing a Kegel, while you're holding in the flow of urine. That's just a side note, tidbit. You're welcome. Um, So, yeah, I see what you're saying. So then through physical therapy, through working with whether it's a Pilates instructor, yoga instructor, who's actually informed about the pelvic floor and the function in this holistic way. Um, and I'm not using holistic in the fad way. I just mean like in a full spectrum way uh, that you can see that relationship to how that helps to retrain and guide your bladder to healthier communication. Yes. Yes. Um, and so if you've done those kind of things and the other thing you can do is like, be aware of what you're taking in. So if you're drinking a lot of caffeine, caffeine is a killer. It's a diuretic, which means it makes your body make extra urine and it's a bladder irritant. So when that urine hits your bladder, it makes you have to pee more. So, um, you know, when people come to me and they're measuring their coffee intake in pots instead of cups, true story that happened. (laughs) Um, I say, you know, like, we know we have something we can work with. Right. No, and I say to people, like, you know, there's no rule, and I'm not the coffee police, but if you weren't bothered, you wouldn't have showed up to my office. So you're bothered enough to listen to my advice, which is, you know, aim for one cup of coffee a day. Um, you know, if you need an extra cup of coffee, you know, you can have coffee. Decaf is better than regular, but decaf is not zero calf. And so if maybe all you wanted was a hot beverage, have a cup of chamomile tea. Um, something that's totally not caffeinated. Yeah. And then the other thing is a lot of people are telling me they're drinking a lot of water because they heard that there's a rule that you have to drink greater than eight cups a day. Um, there's no rules. Um, drink when you're thirsty because your body is really good at telling you when you need water. And all of these, um, those rules with like drink eight cups or more, your weight in half, that many, what whatever it is, 
that doesn't include the water that's in your food. Yes. Like if you eat a cucumber, there's quite a bit of water in there. You know, so uh, just for anyone panicking about their hydration, which hydration is important, um, you don't have to drown yourself. Yes. And, you know, there are people that do these behavioral modifications and then they just, you know, are still bothered. And those are the people that really need to be seeing a urologist or urogynecologist. And there are medications that we can give um, for people who the medications don't work for. Um, we can actually do Botox injections to the bladder. There's an acupuncture type treatment called posterior tibial nerve stimulation. And then again, there's that same pacemaker thing for the bladder called sacral neuromodulation. See, who knew? Who knew? And I, I make this joke because, again, because I speak so openly about really everything. I mean, there's nothing I don't speak openly about. Um, I've had clients come to me, but I also like talk to moms at the playground. And even before I was a mom, you know, I'm talking about this and I joke that it's like everybody's out there peeing their pants and nobody's talking about it because we're embarrassed. And I'm not saying that your feelings are wrong, but I really want people to hear this as a, as a, I guess a permission slip to talk about it, to address it and know that like you have so many options and they, they can be integrated into your life. They don't have to take over your life. You don't have to change your entire life, but you can improve this thing if you want to. Right. If it's not so much a bother and you're like, whatever, this happens sometime. I'm cool. Great. Live your life. But if it's more than that, you have so many options. Um, there was something that this might be so dumb. OK, but it's a question that I have asked around a little bit and I have not been able to get what I feel is a satisfactory answer. OK, Do, are you familiar? I don't know if there's a medical term for this. Um, queefing. I describe it as when, like, your vagina swallows air, but then since there's nowhere for it to go, it puts it back out. What's, what's happening? I mean, I know what's happening, but, like, I've worked with women that this is something that happens that is somewhat out of their control. I know, like, right after I had Everett, it took, it took time for the those muscles to recover. But I experienced that and was like, what do I need to do to keep this from happening? Because I had a couple of embarrassing yoga classes. Do you have any insight? Um, I wish I had more insight. That's not actually something the medical community is great at addressing. Um, I can think of one yeah. scientific paper that I've seen and the scientific term they used for it is passing vaginal wind, I believe. And it's, <laughs> which is which is interesting because it's also like not passing, right? Um, you know, like that feels like there's it's the same start and end. <laughs> but okay, but I get it. I get how they got there. <laughs> so um, basically, you know, it's related to the same issue of laxity of the vaginal walls and um, having you know the air being able to go in, the air coming out. I mean, it's not something that's dangerous, it, you know, is totally something that's not going to be harmful, but it could be bothersome for you and embarrassing. And unfortunately, we don't really have a great way to treat it. I think that starting with being able to control your pelvic floor muscles is really important. And then, you know, there are surgical things we can do for, um, you know, the vaginal wall laxity in terms of, you know, surgery to repair a cystocele, surgery to repair a rectocele, that's the bladder coming down and the rectum coming down. Mm -hmm. Um, but even with those surgeries, it doesn't necessarily fix the issue of air getting trapped in and then coming out at times that you don't want it to come out. Yeah. So I think the answer is we just need to normalize the queef. Yes. Okay, fine. I, on it, on it, where this is step one and we'll make t-shirts. I think that sounds and we'll great. Wear them, we'll wear them around Park Slope. <laughs> <laughs> 
something else um, I wanted to just address while we were talking about urinary incontinence is I wanted to take a minute to talk about the two different kinds of incontinence because I think understanding yes. that there are two different reasons that women will have incontinence um, is really helpful for you know knowing how to address that incontinence um, on your own with behavioral modifications or exercises and then you know knowing when you go to a doctor what you can ask for and you know what the options are. Um, Great. So basically, we talked about the urgency incontinence, which is I'm rushing to the bathroom and I don't make it in time. And then the other kind of incontinence we call stress incontinence has nothing to do with being stressed out. It's actually just um, (laughs) I kind of think of it as like the urethra is too wide open. And so anything that uses your ab muscles, sneezing, jumping, even like yelling, um, all of those things can cause urine to just like leak out, not because your bladder's squeezing when it shouldn't be squeezing, but because the hole is just too wide open. And so anything that increases the pressure around your bladder, um, basically anything that uses it's your a, abs causes the urine to leak out. It's a, again, back to that pressure management system. Now, doesn't stress incontinence, can't that also be a result of a hypertonic pelvic floor, meaning the urethra is actually kind of too tight? So it's not that it's too tight. It's that it's stuck. So you were talking about this dimmer switch, right? There's no dimmer. I kind of describe this as like, imagine that you're like, people can't really imagine their urethra because, you know, if you don't have a sense of your urethra because you never learned about it in a high school health class, then it's hard to imagine exactly yeah. <laughs> what's going on with it. So I describe it as like your biceps. And I'm just going to show you with my uh, arm here. So if your bicep is stuck here, then it's not able to relax completely, but it's also not able to squeeze completely. And that's basically what happens with stress incontinence. Um, The urethra is stuck in this like very closed, but not all the way closed position, but it's not going to close anymore for when you have to sneeze and you need it to close more. And it's not going to open all the way to let all the pee out in a normal way. A healthy muscle can contract and release. That's just like, and I love to relate everything back to how our physical body mirrors our emotional body. It's also like as humans, right? Like really optimally functioning people can, right? Fully engage and fully release. Like we have to be able to turn on and turn off when we get stuck in one or the other or even in the middle. It's, It's not good, Right? That's when we run into trouble. We need to be able to move through the full range of motion. Exactly. Um, something I, w- I just started reading, I'm not that far into it, but Dr. Jen Gunter's The Vagina Bible. And I love it. And something she talks about in the beginning is really how historically medicine is, is so masculine, Right. And we know this also. I mean, women of during their menstruating years, reproductive years, we're left out of many studies because there's too many variables. Um, And we live in the world we live in. So as someone who is taking care of us, right, and wanting to educate us and and these problems we've been taught and conditioned to just tolerate, like saying, like, no, 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 we can, you can live your full, confident, continent life. Like, I'm here to help. If there was like one thing that you could impart to all women or people with female reproductive organs, from your perspective, that like you wish we knew that would, or a piece of advice to help us own our bodies more, to be able to advocate, to, you know, like if there was one thing you could tell, I don't know, is that like too much pressure? That's a big, it's big. big. That's a really big question. And, but like, where would you start? I honestly think, and it's not just because you're like, you know, into muscles and stuff, but I honestly think that it's probably the pelvic floor. Um, Because if you have, control of your pelvic floor muscles, if you know how to use that dimmer switch, I think it can be huge. I think it can help with, um, you know, prolapse, which is the bladder, the rectum, the uterus coming down, you know, not if it's really severe, if it's really severe and, you know, everything's hanging out two inches past the opening of your vagina, um, you could do Kegel till you're blue in the face, not going to help. Um, you probably need surgery at that point, or at least a pessary, which is a rubber thing that goes in the vagina and holds things up. 
Um, but I think that if it's not that severe, I think the pelvic floor physical therapy and exercises, whether you're doing it with a yoga or a Pilates instructor or, you know, a pelvic floor physical therapist, I think can be huge. I think it also helps with the urgency and continence um, in terms of being able to, you know, squeeze your pelvic floor rather than, you know, if you feel like you have to pee and you're like running to the bathroom and the pee's just dripping out, freeze and squeeze, stop running, squeeze the pelvic floor and, you know, let that urge go away, let the bladder muscle relax. And then you can calmly walk to the bathroom after that. And then also for the stress urinary incontinence, which is like any exercise causes me to leak urine, um, being able to contract your pelvic floor and to relax it, I think is huge. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me and listening to the end of this episode. Look at you. You're someone who finishes what they start. I love that about you. And if you're picking up what I'm laying down, be sure to visit me over at alyssaalter.com for more resources on how you can alter your life, like downloading the five-minute meditation that I use to start my day with confidence and ease, all before getting out of bed. See you next week.